Okay, when you get to the bottom of Matthew chapter 24, the study I did, guess what? Click at the bottom, and we come to Matthew chapter 25. Well, wait a minute. Does Matthew chapter 25 begin with 24:45? Kind of does. Kind of does. This brings us to a section, 2445 to 2530. Now there's a couple of parables in here at great length and great detail that has bearing, some bearing on when Christ's second coming is relative to this book we're looking at, Glen Hill, and this tremendous dilemma of Christianity because Jesus Christ came again. Of course, these three parables, man, could not have occurred. Jerusalem, Titus destroying Jerusalem, and the Jewish period. Besides that, Glen Hill offers an explanation that the law was done away with. No, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. In what sense? The law was a measure, a schoolmaster, to show how far short you fell from keeping the Mosaic Law or any excellent rules of behavior. The Mosaic Law is the best. It came right of the mouth of God. And then you turn to a Savior. There's no end to the Mosaic Law. And it served its purpose. And when Christ comes again, at first he's going to fulfill his purpose through the church. Because the fulfillment by mankind of the law through the dispensation of the church, Jewish priests, the Israelite people. It's not going to work. You need a perfect and holy God to do that for you. Guess what the new covenant is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah? New covenant. Doing away with the Mosaic law period, Mosaic law, the new covenant will be fulfilled and put, put into play and fulfilled through the house of Judah and the house of Israel. All will believe in a coming Messiah, Savior. God will do all the work, transforming that generation of Israelites into perfect Jewish people, knowing the perfect law of right of God perfectly, living many, many hundreds of years through the millennial rule, and which time they will co-rule with Christ. Does that sound like the Jewish age period was destroyed and Israel destroyed? No. Israel is now being fulfilled as the new covenant, God's chosen people, that generation, second coming. That was not A.D. 70. Now, if you want to look at that, look at Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, or better yet, go to the new covenant study I've done, utilizing the index, which I can find for you here. Just go to the top of the page. Look up under N for New. And scroll on down to New Covenant. Nothing in here about the destruction of the Mosaic Law period and the Israelite people and the deal God had with Israel. The New Covenant. The time of the never-to-be-equal distress of God's people, Israel. All twelve tribes were gathering restoration and ongoing prosperity of both Israel and Judah together as one people into a forever presence and possession of the entire promised land and the exhibiting by them of consistent godliness constitute the key context of the fulfillment of the new covenant to the exclusion of all other times which do not have all of this in view. AD 70, right? Wrong. That hasn't happened yet, has it? And Christ's second coming will be the buzzer the pinpoint when that will all precisely happen because all of Israel, according to Old Testament and New Testament, will believe in their coming Messiah, Savior, and that's when the New Covenant will be fulfilled in the house of Israel and the house of Judah alone. There it is. There's the paragraph. Jeremiah 31 to 3, 31, 31 to 34, and so on. All the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Does that say the church? No. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers in the day of my taking them by the hand, bringing them out of the land of Egypt. 
by covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, and so on. Keep reading. That did not happen in AD 70. The destruction of Jerusalem did it. Yet future. Christ coming in his second coming. Where is Israel? Ruling as a kingdom of priests over the Gentile nations. Keeping everything in order. Righteousness is the rule. Did not happen in AD 70. So let's go back to where we left off in Matthew 25. Keep that in mind. The incredible signs were discussed which precede our Lord's second coming, followed by the description of the very moment when our Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in his full glory coming on the clouds. Not AD 70. Then followed by an illustration about a fig tree blooming which exemplifies the imminence of summer just as our Lord's return is exemplified as imminent when all of these signs occur. And Matthew, then Matthew followed up with the two illustrations which admonished those living during the tribulation times to be ever watchful, be prepared and faithful because of the judgment and consequences when the Lord does return, such that his return will in the final analysis be as unexpected as a thief in the knife when he comes. In the night. After this comes the three parables sandwiched in between the preceding accounts of the imminent return of the king and the details of the end of chapter 25 of his judgment of tribulation believers and unbelievers. So parable number 1, 24, 45 to 51, refers to our Lord's judgment of believers, both faithful and unfaithful, faithful servant and wicked servant, at the end of the tribulation period, not A.D. 70. He will judge the unfaithful believers severely. They will suffer loss of eternal rewards, even to the extent of suffering, weeping, and gnashing of teeth when they enter the kingdom of rule. And he will reward the faithful believers with all of his possessions, relative to the millennial rule about to begin on the earth. <clears throat> and who is going to co-rule with them? Israel. Perfect resurrection, a perfect mortal bodies rather, sinless, knowing the word of God perfectly. Parable number 2, Matthew 25, 1-13, 10 virgins, refers to the relative preparedness of believers during the tribulation time. Those believers who are not in a constant state of readiness, who do not continually maintain a state of faithfulness, will not be included in the wedding feast of the Lord, and will be left outside in the outer darkness. Those believers who are faithful, remaining prepared and at the door, will be included in the celebration of that feast. Not the second coming yet. This happens then. Thirdly, we have the parable of the talents. So parable number 2, 25, 1 to 13, 10 virgins, refers to the relative preparedness of believers during the tribulation time. Those believers who are not in a constant state of readiness, who do not continually maintain a state of faithfulness, will not be included in the wedding feast of the Lord. Where is this in AD 70? And will be left outside in the outer darkness. Those believers who are faithful will remain remaining prepared and at the door will be included in the celebration of that feast. Thirdly, we have the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Pastor Hill. Matthew 25 is part of Matthew 24. You just didn't come down the mountain at the end of 24 and then go back up the next day. Ah, I got a different sermon for you. This is ongoing. Parable of the talents, which reflects the relative rewards according to one's faithful service or non-service. Where is this in AD 70? These believers of the tribulation who physically survived to the end, who were faithful to the specific tasks assigned to them, will be put in charge, co-rulership, during their new lives in the millennium. Those believers who are unfaithful, even rebellious and sinful, will have all things taken away from them and will enter the millennium life with nothing and for a season be cast into a location on the millennial earth, on the millennium earth, outside of the fellowship of the wedding banquet and some of the other places on the, where you can have fellowship with God, where there is a relative darkness. Their utter disappointment will lead them to weep and gnash their teeth at the devastating loss that they, that they incurred during their wasted life on earth. Uh, you could say will have incurred during the wasted life on earth in their mortal bodies. They didn't serve the Lord. They didn't have time for him. They were so busy with temporal things that pass away. Other passages indicate that unfaithful tribulation believers will not endure to the end. 
will physically die, die early. They will enter heaven prematurely in their new immortal bodies, albeit, and then they will come back to earth with the Lord at his second coming. And I should say this, but they will suffer eternal loss of eternal rewards. Whatever rewards they, they should have gotten were slanted or slated for them, they will not receive. Now you can go into depth on this, parable of the faithful and unfaithful servants, you can break it down, move on from that if you wish. We have comparisons with Luke and Matthew. Amazing, amazing. And keep on moving down. Scripture elsewhere indicates that not all believers will be faithful. Nevertheless, all will make it to heaven. We have to verify that. How much unfaithful do you have to be? You can be a whole bunch of unfaithful, but you're made a permanent place. Your permanent place is in heaven based on the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. Thank God for that. We have the judgment seat of Christ. We have all that. So much more to go through, but let's go back to his book. The point is we're examining the book in the light of Christ's second coming, the events preceding, and the events following on into the new heavens and the new earth, which he denies ever, heavens and earth will never be destroyed according against Peter, what Peter says. So we're back at the study. Are you convinced now, just going through Matthew 24, and not all of it, Matthew 24 and 25 are together, chapter headings and chapter numbers were added later. But Christianity's great dilemma, is Jesus Christ coming again or is he not, by Glenn Hill, that's been severely questioned, challenged, by just going through Matthew chapter 24 and part of what 25 does. You can look at those parables if you wish later on. Now, let's go to the next thing. The next point, which is point two, so we can find it. I've yet to put a table of contents on this. Point two. Author Hill brings up Revelation 6, 15 to 17 specifically. We're moving on to an excerpt on page 23 of Glenn Hill's book to confirm what Bible study manuals has presented so far as an accurate rebuttal. In Revelation 6, 15 to 17, Glenn Hill says, John even used Jesus' own words in describing this same time and the desperate feeling among the people and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, this is in AD 70, and from the wrath of the Lamb. All these references were about the coming judgment of God and the Jewish people. Wow, where is that? Just the Jewish, but not the whole planet? It was coming soon in the lifetime of those women who were weeping for Jesus. For those who did believe, who did follow Jesus, Peter said they would be saved from the wrath to come. You don't follow and get saved from wrath. You believe and get saved from wrath. First Thessalonians 1.10 Their deliverance from the calamities coming upon Judah certainly would begin with their obeying Jesus' commands to hastily flee to the mountains when they saw armies begin to surround Jerusalem. Well, my point is, shouldn't we go back a little in Revelation chapter 6 to figure out the context before we get to Revelation 6, 15 to 16? we got 14 verses to go. So here's an excerpt in the study of Matthew chapter 24, which deals with Revelation chapter 6 in view with corroborating context from other passages in both Old and New Testaments, which clearly indicate that none of these things has occurred yet, not even in A.D. 70. Page 